Bangladesh to come and deliver his remarks. So just a bit about Brother Zafir Bangladesh. Uh, he is the director of the Institute of Contemporary Islamic Thought based in Toronto, Canada. He is also on the editorial board of Crescent International. As well, he is also the author of several books. And one of his latest books is entitled Power, Manifestations of the Sira, Examining the Letters and Treaties of the Messenger of Allah. And it was just published in 2011. And it won the prestigious Professor Abdul Jabbar Shakir Award in Pakistan as the best Sira book for 2012-2013. Please welcome him with the love salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa jal farafti. Auz billah min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina wa habibina wa khatimu al-anbiyahi wa al-mursaleen. على آله وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحاب المنتجبين. ما سلام محمد وعلى محمد. Respected ulama, our guests, respected brothers and sisters in Islam, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Before I begin, uh, allow me to explain one of our chief uh, guests or speakers, Kevin Barrett, who was supposed to be with us today, could not make it, not because he was not coming to Canada, but he was detained at the Canadian border for four hours. Shame interrogated and then sent back. And then he was detained for four hours by the Americans and also interrogated by the Americans. Now what was Kevin Barrett's fault or crime? He is an outspoken critic. But before that, actually he happens to be a former war veteran. Somebody who had participated in America's wars, but now he runs a website by the name of Veterans Today. He also runs a radio program called Truth Jihad. And recently he compiled a book titled We Are Not Charlie Hebdo, in which he included papers by a number of scholars, Christians, Jewish scholars, Muslim scholars, atheists. He also requested me to contribute an article, which I did. I was very glad to do so. And he had included the Rahbar's letter that was addressed to the youth of North America and Europe that was widely circulated all around the world. And so one of the reasons why Kevin Barrett was disallowed into Canada was that he published that book called We Are Not Charlie Hebdo. Mm. And so we are told that we live in a free country. Oh yeah. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. you know, it's so free that they cannot tolerate an alternative point of view. As was pointed out earlier, there are people outside howling like, I don't know, I wouldn't use whatever words you want to use. Uh, and you know, two days ago, one of the reporters from York region called me and she said that uh, we hear you are holding a program um, at your center. And I told them, yes, that is true. And she said that we hear that there is going to be a protest against your meeting. So I said, I'm really surprised as to why anybody would want to hold a protest rally against a meeting whose theme is Imam Khomeini's struggle against injustice. So I said, if we are speaking out against injustice, 
It means that these people that are standing outside probably are supporting injustice. So she said, no, 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 it's not like that. I said, well, why isn't it like that? I said, if I tell you that we should not have wars and somebody wants to protest against it, that means those people want wars. So then she said, well, we hear that you are going to be giving certain presents to people. Who's paying you? And it's a, it's, I just was reminded that, of course, you know, the, some of the brothers are going to be giving uh, a couple of laptops and cameras, etc., to children that are going to participate in the quiz competition, etc. I told that young lady, I said, look, uh, if you want a laptop, and nowadays a laptop costs about a couple of hundred dollars, so I can donate you one. I don't think there's a big, big deal about it. You, know, you don't need to worry about it. And I said, but let me tell you about the people that are going to hold this protest outside our venue. I said that these people, most of them, have come as political refugees from Iran. And I said, they have come paid for by my tax dollars, as a law-abiding Canadian citizen working in this country for 41 years, I've not missed a single day of work. In fact, I virtually work seven days a week. And I said, these people that have come as political refugees on my tax dollars, they live in huge mansions in Richmond Hill. So I said, I've worked for 41 years and I haven't earned enough money to buy a mansion for myself. I still live in a very ordinary, humble house. Where did these guys get so much money from that they can live in mansions? So again, she said, oh, it's a very complicated issue. I said, no, no, wait a minute. I said, you are an intelligent lady. I can, even though I don't see you, but I can, you are speaking on the phone. But you sound like an intelligent person. It simply cannot be that these people who are claiming that they were being persecuted in Iran, that they would be able to bring millions of dollars out of Iran and by living in mansions, and they still think that there is something wrong with Iran. So, of course, ultimately she realized, and, you know, the conversation ended. But I've been told that outside, Jason Kenney, the Minister of Defense, has come to speak. <laughs> and there's also Raza Muridi, the MPP. Sure. I think for you Muslims now, make note of this. Somebody brought him to our center as well, seeking support. And and I, I'm sure we know what we're going to do with him when he tries to enter this, these premises next time. But it's for you as well, challenge, that he comes around this hypocrite, this manafik, seeking support of the Muslims and then standing outside and giving advertisements in newspapers, calling people to protest against this, this gathering. And what is this gathering for? That we are commemorating Imam Khomeini's anniversary and we're talking about Imam Khomeini's struggle against injustice. And of course, that... Zionist agent Tariq Fatah also is over there. That man is a Muslim hater. He licks the boots of the Zionists, but he hates anything to do with Islam. And he proudly says that my forefathers were Hindus. Good to you. You want to be a Hindu? That's your problem. We don't care. But don't call yourself a Muslim man. And then, of course, that, that uh, woman, Peter McKay's wife, Nazneen Afshinja, I've been told that she's also over there. But I'm glad, as Marana Bhakti had pointed out, that now we are on the inside, sitting in this, mashallah, fairly comfortable environment, and let them stand out in the rain and blow their heads off, whatever they want to do. Inshallah, we'll get much more colder. Inshallah, yes. And I'm hoping that when we have our next uh, gathering like this, that perhaps Harper will also come and protest ourselves. <laughs> So it seems to me that we are really doing something right. Because if we were not doing something right, why would these people be protesting against us? You know, and, and what is our gathering for? Our gathering is for talking about the Imam's struggle, Rahmullah, his struggle against injustice. And let me share a few aspects with you. In the last century, in the 20th century, there have been many changes and many claims to revolutions in the Muslim world in particular. For instance, 
1925, 1926, uh, the Najati Bedouins, I don't think I even want to call them Saudis, they are Najati Bedouins. And you know who the Bedouins are, what the Quran says about Bedouins. <laughs> these, these ignorant Aram, as the Quran calls them, they burst out of Najat, and they had done so before as well. They captured Mecca and Al Madina and perpetrated horrible crimes in these two holy cities. And I think as Muslims, we ought to be aware of the horrible crimes that they have perpetrated against the Ahlul Bayt, against the Sahaba. And now they even have evil intentions on the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there was one change that occurred in the Arabian Peninsula in 1925-1926. Then we had the so-called Free Officers Revolution in Egypt in 1952. Thereafter, followed by a similar military coup in Libya in 1969. And prior to that, we also had the creation of Pakistan in 1947. Now I want you to please uh, pay attention to this and look at all of those changes that occurred in those countries uh, that were called revolutions, but they were nothing more than noisy palace reshuffles. So one clown is thrown out and another clown goes and occupies the palace. The only clear categorical change and a revolution occurred in Iran in January, February of 1979 led by Imam Khomeini Rahimullah. It was a genuine Islamic revolution. And I know that although as you know I don't talk in terms of Shia or Sunni that's irrelevant as Moana Bakhtu pointed out, we should be talking in terms of Muslims. But I know that coming from that particular school of thought, and I happen to come from the Sydney school of thought, I was born in that, into that family. In the Shia tradition, participating in direct political activities was not considered to be legitimate activity. So what the Imam did was, through his series of lectures in Najaf, when he was in exile, he gave these lectures about the importance of an Islamic government, hukumat e islami as Imam Khomeini called it. And he basically brought about through his ijtihad in Shia political thought, bringing Shia thinking out of that narrow confine of not participating in political activity in the Ghaiba of Imam alayhi salam, that Imam Khomeini said, no, we cannot wait for the arrival of the Imam. We have to struggle, we have to strive to create that environment. And you know, even in Najaf, there were Ula, Shia ulama that opposed him. But the Imam, first of, all, first of all, had to bring about an intellectual revolution in the thought of the people, and then brought about the revolution through the change that occurred in Iran. And what is important about the Islamic revolution is, and Eric Warburg has also talked about it in his book, uh, Islamic Challenge to Imperialism, and I invite all of you please to get a copy of it. It's a very, very good book. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important contribution to understanding uh, the Islamic revolution. And in fact, the whole of the uh, various uh, aspects and various dimensions of struggle against imperialism and why some of them have failed and will continue to fail and why the Islamic revolution succeeded because of its basic nature. But that was the main, most important point was that the Islamic revolution in Iran was a totally non-violent change. The Imam did not permit people to take up arms against the Shah's army. Even though the Shah's army killed more than 80,000 people in that one year period when the revolution started in the, at the beginning of 1978. And then it's interesting to know that in November of 1979, 
The Shah had come to the United States, and Jimmy Carter, who was then the President of the United States, he referred to Iran under the Shah's regime as an island of stability in a sea of turbulence. An island of stability. But alhamdulillah, in a year's time, that, uh, that so-called island of stability was swept away by the revolutionary tide of the Islamic Revolution. Another aspect that I think is very, very important about the Islamic Revolution and the Imam's contribution is that you would know that any word, any time you participate in any activity, any time that you bring about any change, if you face severe opposition from the powers that be, then rest assured that you are on the right track. As we are facing today, so alhamdulillah it should give us comfort and it should give us hope that we are alhamdulillah on the right track. And this is precisely what the Prophet sallallahu faced for 13 years in Mecca and many years more in Medina when he launched his vision of Islam in the Arabian Peninsula. of the Arabian Peninsula are the descendants of Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab. They are the ones that are controlling the Arabian Peninsula. And it is our obligation to struggle and strive to get rid of them because the Hijaz and the Arabian Peninsula does not belong to these Najati Bedouins. They are a blot on the name of Islam and we have to get rid of them so that Islam's holy places can be brought back under the control of committed Muslims, sincere Muslims, who would revive the spirit of Islam and revive the spirit of Hajj as it has to be performed so that Muslims can be mobilized to remove injustice from the world. Pakistan High Court as well as in the East Pakistan High Court. 
So in East Pakistan, today is Bangladesh, at that time East Pakistan, the High Court ruled in favor of the Jamaat Islami to say that the ban against the Jamaat Islami was illegal according to the law of Pakistan. West Pakistan, of course, being more under the control of the military dictatorship, ruled that the ban is legal and therefore the Jamaat Islami should remain banned. So their lawyers took the matter to the Supreme Court of Pakistan. And the Supreme Court of Pakistan finally ruled, and there were judges at that time that had enough integrity, they ruled that the ban on the Jamaat Islami is illegal. And what was the reason why the military regime had arrested Maulana Madhudi and his uh, followers and his band the Jamaat? Because the government of Pakistan said that by publishing this article in Tarjaman al Quran, the Jamaat Islami was undermining friendly relations with another friendly country and it was against Pakistan's national interests. That was the excuse that was used. But the Supreme Court of Pakistan had judges with enough integrity to say that the ban on the Jamaat Islami was illegal and that the leadership of the Jamaat Islami should be released. And they were of course released. I mention this to you because of several factors that I think we need to keep in mind. And the first is that the Imam always made an effort to reach out to everybody. He was about this Shia Sunni thing. So, in Mecca, when he discovered that Maulana Madhudi is there, he went to meet him. Maulana Madhudi, of course, comes from a Sunni background. But the Imam was not inhibited by this. He reached out to Maulana Madhudi, and I think there was a positive result. I think I may have talked about this aspect before, but I want to talk about it again. Perhaps some of you may not have heard it. When the Islamic Revolution succeeded in Iran, in April of 1979, the Imam sent two of his emissaries with a personal letter to Maulana Madhudi, who was in Lahore at that time. And, of course, expressing the Imam's best wishes to Maulana Madhudi, uh, feelings of support, and uh, even inviting Maulana Madhudi to come to Iran to visit uh, the Imam and be a guest of the Islamic Republic. Unfortunately, Maulana Madhudi was seriously ill at that time. And within a couple of months of that, he, his son, who used to live in Buffalo, was a medical doctor, he brought him there to Buffalo. In August of 1979, myself and about 20 or 30 other Muslims, we went to visit Maulana Madhudi in Buffalo. We were staying at his son's house. And during the conversation, of course, many people were talking about what's happening in Pakistan, and etc., etc. I asked Maulana Madhuri as to what was his impression of the Islamic Revolution and what did he think of Imam Khomeini. These were the words that I'm going to paraphrase. Maulana Madhuri said that it is an Islamic Revolution and that I pray to Allah to give it enough time to consolidate itself so that it would be able to withstand any external aggression that I see will be launched against this Islamic State of ours. A Sunni alim praying for the Islamic revolution in Iran and praying for its success. Naray Salawat! As you know, the Islamic Republic of Iran was attacked on September 22, 1980. Maulana Madhudi had died exactly one year prior to that on September 22, 1979. And his prediction that it would be attacked from external forces because he called it an Islamic revolution. That this Islamic revolution, and I think any leading scholar will tell you that if you are on the path of Islam, that you are bound to face these challenges because the Tahrut will not let you rest in peace. But because the Islamic revolution is Islamic, that it has been able to withstand all of these pressures over the last 
25 or 26 years. You look at the Middle Eastern region today, you have externally instigated chaos in Syria, the same goes for Iraq, Lebanon, and now this Wahhabi Najati Bedouins attack on Yemen. And even inside the Arabian Peninsula, there is a great deal of chaos. And I'll talk about it in a minute. But if you compare all of that with what is happening in the Islamic Republic of Iran, despite the sanctions, 35 years of sanctions, despite the external war, despite the internal sabotage, and when you go around, you'll see the photographs of the number of people that have been martyred during during the years of the revolution. That the Islamic Republic has stood not only to defend itself, but it has become stronger as a result of their, their sacrifices and their efforts. You see, if you are truly committed, then you can be rest assured that you will have the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with you. And now you look at the Islamic Republic and compare it to any of these other countries in the region. It's the only country that is stable. It is the only country where they are making progress. It is the only country where the poor are looked after. In fact, even opponents of the Islamic Republic, people a couple of years ago, they had gone to Iran and when they came back, they said we were absolutely amazed that, you know, we thought when we had arrived in Tehran, that Tehran would look, look like a rundown city because it's under sanctions. And you're surprised that there are highways, there are major buildings being built, there are fancy hotels, all kinds of things, shopping malls full of people. He said, this is incredible. You cannot even imagine that a country under sanctions would be like this. Where did this come from? It is because the leadership is committed to Islam, the leadership is sincere, and therefore the people have become, and they have achieved this taqwa in their lives. Because taqwa is contagious. If the leadership is taqwa, the people become taqwa. You create that environment in which taqwa permeates to other people. And that is what the example of the Islamic revolution is. But you know something? You know, as I said, I come from a Sunni background. For me, Sunni Shia is not a relevant issue at all. And you know that my record speaks for itself. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I believe that the Islamic revolution is the fulfillment of a Quranic ayat and a hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, right at the end of Surah Muhammad, there's a portion of the ayat which says, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْا يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْقَالَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you, of course addressing the Muslims, that if you abandon Allah's deen, Allah's way, that he will replace you by another people that will not be like you. And when the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina recited this ayah to his companions, they were surprised, they said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who would be these people? That would replace us while well, we are with you, we are Arabs, we have been with you all the time, we have invited you here to Medina, we struggled with you in Mecca. Salman al Farsi was standing next to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he put his hand on his shoulders and he said that they would be his descendants. from? It doesn't come from a Shia tafsir. I'm sure it probably is in one of them. It comes from Ibn Kasir's tafsir. One of the most conservative Sunni scholars that have written tafsir. Whom this Wahhabi Bedouin, Najwin, Najri Bedouins also quote extensively. It is in the tafsir, Ibn Kasir, go and read it. I checked many other tafsir I didn't find. It is only in among the Sunni 
Mufas says, it's only in tafsir Ibn Kasir. So you can see that what the Prophet Sallallahu had said, when this ayat was revealed, it has been fulfilled in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Because these Arabian Bedouins have abandoned Islam, they claim to be Muslims, but they don't follow any teachings of the Quran, of the Sunnah and the Seerah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Salawat. You see, there is absolutely no notion of kingship in Islam. Islam does not permit kingship. In fact, there is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, there was somebody who had come to him and called him the Prince of the Arabs. And he stopped the person and he said, no, you don't call me that. I am the messenger and servant of Allah. I am not the prince. I don't wish to be a prince or a king. Yet these people, these tribal thieves and robbers, and that's exactly what Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud was. He actually used to rob caravans, even pilgrims caravans. That's what he used to do. And I want to conclude with this. that after the, the last king died on January 23rd of this year and having studied the situation in the Arabian Peninsula for many many years uh, I decided to compile a book and the book I compiled in a matter of three months here it is it's called the Doomed Kingdom of the House of Saud. And in this, I have analyzed and I've explained why this family will not be around for too long, inshallah. And basically, what I've done is I have analyzed from their own sources, I've quoted their own scholars, their own economists, their own political analysts, etc. to point out that there is deep turmoil inside the Arabian Peninsula. There are 40,000 political prisoners in the Arabian Peninsula. And they're not all our Shia brothers from the eastern province. They include quote-unquote Sunni ulama, Sunni academics, Sunni lawyers, Sunni students, Sunni professors. 40,000 of them are languishing in prisons in that desert kingdom over there. Further, that these thieves, they steal the money of the country and yet there is great poverty inside that country. And you would think that it would be unthinkable to have poverty in a country that earns 300 billion dollars a year from oil revenues and another 32 to 35 billion dollars from Hajj pilgrimage every year that there would be no poverty yet there is at least 60 percent people in that kingdom live in poverty according to the, the uh, economists of that country itself 60 to 70 percent of the people over there cannot own homes because they are so poor but all of these figures, facts and figures, and evidence is presented in this book. As it was announced, this book is available for $20, as is Eric's latest book. I invite all of you please to get a copy. And if you take both of them, you can pay $30 for both of them, so you'll save some money as well. And you know, this, this is not necessarily meant to be a sort of a book sale, but I think it is important that we do apprise ourselves of what is taking place, that it is important for us to know our enemies so that we can plan accordingly. Inshallah. And I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect the Islamic revolution, inshallah. that inshallah. the Imam's legacy will continue to grow, that more and more people will turn towards it because he spoke against injustice, he spoke against tyranny. And I, I can tell you, I've, I've seen the Imam, I've been to his house, 
and not once but many times, he led a very, very simple and humble life. And again, the same is true of the Rahman. May Allah give him a long life. This means a very, very simple and humble life. And as, as was mentioned earlier, there are some nonsensical claims. People saying, oh, he is worth so many billions of dollars. They say, well, where, where, did, where are those billions of dollars? I mean, all of Iran's assets are frozen. So where does he keep his money, for God's sake? And if you know, you know, that, that blighter King Abdullah was worth 20 billion dollars and the man couldn't even write his own name. He was a totally illiterate. I don't know how he got 20 billion dollars. Uh, you know, his nephew, uh, Walid bin Kalal, is worth 21 billion dollars and so on. And these, you know, they have stolen money left, right and center. And yet, there are 60% people living in absolute poverty over there. So you can see that things are changing. Then I want to assure you that we should not lose hope. That Islam teaches us and that the Prophet وسلم, Sunnah and Sirah teaches us that we must always be optimistic. That if we are on the right path, that if we are optimistic, that we have hope in Allah and His help, that inshallah Allah's help will be with us. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So they came out. 
and we wouldn't have, uh, not that we want Gaza to be attacked, but we wouldn't have that publicity to help our campaign. And secondly, those that oppose us uh, would also come out in large numbers. So we have a great challenge to face. So it's a challenge for all of us to rise up to that occasion and to make sure that we make a uh, Al Quds Day rally as successful as we did last year. And just one uh, final comment quickly. Uh, those of you, of course, who want to ask questions, please do so, but make sure that you ask a question briefly so we can give uh, as many people as possible an opportunity. So please feel free to ask your questions. In fact, uh, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers uh, for working to unite Muslims in today's uh, critical situation where the whole storm is coming against uh, Islam and they want to divide. My question is about Maulana Mawdudi. He is one of the great alim, scholar, writer, and he was one of the uh, uh, first Muslim scholar who wrote the Charter of Islamic Women Rights. And uh, I was worried about, uh, because I'm very much uh, attached with Maulana Maududi in my lifetime, I was uh, very much surprised when I heard and I read that Maulana Maududi was uh, uh, declared kafir in Pakistan by some of the Islamic uh, Association. And I'm also worried about uh, the Islamic Jamaat. Are they still uh, considering Maulana Maududi as an Islamic scholar or also they consider him as a Kafir? Prophet. Dishing out these fatwas of takfir, etc., are basically people that come from a Devadi background in the Bangladesh and Madrasa in India, which has, of course, uh, close links and great, great influence by um, this Wahhabi ideology. And uh, during uh, Maulana Madhudi's lifetime, there was issuing out these fatwas against him, which are totally uncalled for. What I also want to point out to you is that, um, um, of course, uh, Maulana Madhudi, despite his great learning and everything, uh, and I respect him tremendously, I've read uh, a lot of his books, and I benefit from his uh, tafsir that is called the Hebrew Quran. It's a six volume set in Urdu. Uh, Maulana Madhudi also, of course, made some political errors in the sense of his political judgments. And one of those was to opt for participating in elections under a system that is the Dawoodi system. And we have been very clear about this, we have written about this in the Press and International, that any Muslims that make that mistake that you participate in the Dawoodi system, uh, two things happen. Number one, uh, they will not allow an Islamic party to come to power, and even if it does, as it happened in Egypt, few years ago, two, two, three years ago, that they will crush you, they will destroy you. And secondly, they use these Islamic parties and Islamic groups to basically gain legitimacy for that Dawoodi system. So, uh, our position has been very clear in terms of uh, Islamic leaders being clear about this issue, otherwise they will fall into this, this trap. It happened in Algeria, it has happened in Pakistan, to happen there, for example, in Egypt and a number of places. So, Muslims should not be providing legitimacy to these illegitimate uh, systems that are in Muslim societies. And this is what, alhamdulillah, Imam Khomeini did, because at one stage, some of his uh, followers came to him and said, uh, Imam, why don't we lodge a case in the courts, because the Shah is not allowing us to operate as a legal entity. So the Imam's reply was very forthright, very clear. He said, we do not consider the Shah's regime to be legitimate. How can you consider his courts to be legitimate? So he categorically rejected any such things. But to just come back to your question with respect to this purpose of the fear against Maulana Madhudi, I'm afraid 
this is a disease that exists in the minds of certain kinds of people. And you still see that strain in the Takfiris, in the uh, group calling themselves, are called Daesh or ISIS or ISIL or whatever. These people are continuing with that tradition. This comes from the Wahhabi mindset. And this has also unfortunately permeated uh, India and Pakistan. But I think today, I, I believe that the vast majority of the people in Pakistan uh, would categorically reject those kinds of designations altogether. I hope I'll try to answer the question.